particular. Um, just before we get going, uh, I just wanted to um, make a couple of acknowledgements. Uh, the first is um, that we work alongside Mopan and Yucatec Maya peoples uh, in Belize. And so a lot of the work uh, that we're going or research we'll be talking about, it takes place in what's considered sort of the modern day Maya cultural heartland of Belize, which is the Southern districts of Stan Creek uh, and Toledo. And then in Alberta, of course, acknowledging the homeland of the many diverse First Nations and Métis people whose ancestors have walked this land since time immemorial. Uh, we're grateful to work, live and learn uh, on the traditional territory of Treaty 8. And we recognize that we are all treaty people. And just as another note, um, because this is archaeology, uh, often archaeologists deal with human remains. There will not be any human human remains shown in this presentation. Um, so if you have a concern about that, um, don't worry. That that's not something that's going to be. Ooh. Okay. So uh, just as a bit of an introduction to who we are, other than uh, what Taylor's already said. Um, so my name is Megan. I'm originally from Thunder Bay, Ontario in Robinson Superior Treaty Territory. I moved to Alberta in back in 1998 uh, to go start my undergrad at the University of Calgary. And I've been in Alberta on and off ever since then. Um, my research um, takes place primarily in Mexico and Central America, where I've been doing uh, research both as a student and as a professor for over 20 years now. Um, if I'm forced to, to say what my specialization is in archaeology, I typically say that I'm a household archaeologist. And that means that I specifically focus on domestic locations, so houses and everything that happens in and around houses. Um, in terms of my uh, GP connection, uh, I just moved here in 2019, and in terms of my community involvement, I'm a member of the Girl Guides of Canada here in Grand Prairie, and also a member of the South Peace Regional uh, uh, Archives. Um, and I'm uh, Sean Morton, um, born and raised in Baltimore, Ontario, which is in the uh, Williams Treaties and the Johnson Butler Purchase Territory. Um, I have more than 20 years of experience uh, doing archaeology. Uh, most of my research experience has been in Central America and Mexico, although uh, I moved out here for grad school um, back in the day. And so now I have uh, about 18 years, which I really uh, sounds like a lot when I say it out loud and freaks me out a bit, but 18 years of uh, consulting archaeology experience here in uh, Alberta. Um, in terms of research interests, I'm generally into looking at the ways that people um, inscribe their identity on or, um, and, and in some ways are defined by uh, essentially places, right, their, their sense of place. And so how we can look at um, who people are from, um, from what they've done and where they live and what they've left behind. Um, I am also a member of Scouting, in this case, so Scouts Canada. So I'd like to give a, a shout out to the uh, third Grand Prairie uh, Cub Scouts, Dib Dib Dib, um, and a, a member of the board of the uh, South Peace Regional Archives. Uh, and today, we're going to be talking about uh, our current, or well, we'll talk about, a bit about what archaeology is, um, for those who aren't yet sure. Um, we'll also talk about our current or, pre or previous and ongoing research in Belize uh, before transitioning into um, some plots and plans for um, perhaps the future um, and a local archaeology project here in uh, the Byzantine area. So what is archaeology? Um, archaeology is one of the sub-disciplines of anthropology um, or the study of people um, and it's often confused with paleontology, which is a big thing in this neck of the woods. Um, it's confused, I'm guessing, because, well, because we, we dig in the ground um, and because we kind of share a questionable fashion sense with paleontologists. Um, but essentially the, the rule is, if it has to do with humans, it's archaeology. No humans, no archaeology. Um, our, in terms of kind of how archaeologists go about doing their work, we study people based on the things that they leave behind. And those things are, are variable. They might be little broken bits of pottery or corroded bits of metal. Um, they might be 
a, a lost uh, stone projectile point. They might be the tumbled remains of, uh, of architecture. Um, and I want you to do me a, a favor. I want you to close your eyes for, for just a second, right? And I want you to imagine an archeologist at work. So I want you to smell the dust and I want you to, to hear blowing on the breeze the sounds of shovels and, and picks and, and language that'll make a sailor blush, right? Picture where you are. Okay, now open your eyes. And were you picturing something like this? Right? Or maybe something like this, right? Um, these are archeological, archeological sites and our research in Belize would fit along these lines. So our current project in Belize, which uh, Megan's going to chat about in just a second here, is focused on a 1300 year old Maya, ancient Maya town site. Um, and so it's got that kind of that kind of thing going on. However, archaeology isn't just about those people back then over there. It's not just about the distant past either. Um, this, if you're familiar with archaeology in Canada, um, an image like this might be uh, familiar to you. So this is a, an archaeological dig, a particularly large one, admittedly. Um, focused on an ancient uh, indigenous site or First Nation site just outside of, of Thunder Bay, right? And the materials that we're working with, they're not always what one might expect. So this, for instance, here, next slide, is also an archaeological site. Um, so again, archaeologists, uh, so long as you're in trying to understand human behavior, human life ways, based on the stuff we leave behind. You're doing archeology. span So there's been a bunch of really neat work um, called, uh, it kind of gets subsumed under the title Garbology, a good name for it. Um, looking at things like uh, modern refuse to, uh, disposal patterns and uh, waste management and stuff like this and trying to use archeological techniques um, to get a handle on some of these problems in, in our world um, today. We can also use archeological methods to shed light on events and processes and, and people much, much closer to home. Um, and that's what we're proposing to do with a, a local project. Um, and we will talk about um, the kind of a proposal perhaps for, the, uh, for an archeological project based at the uh, old Byzantium town site. Um, and so we'll get back to that in a bit, but first, yeah, so thanks, uh, Sean. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about our research uh, that we've been conducting in Belize, this particular uh, program since 2014, um, I initiated the Stan Creek Regional Archaeology Project, or also called SCRAP, um, uh, in Belize with a colleague uh, alongside our community liaison for uh, the village of Mayamopan, uh, Mr. Ihinio Chiak Sr., who we've been working with since then. Sean later joined us in, two th in 2015, um, and we, we published about the start of our project. So if you are uh, interested in reading, you can go to our website and there's our, our web address there. Uh, and we do put all of our publications up there so you can read uh, in, the art, in the journal Mexicon all about the sort of beginnings of our project. In general, uh, the goals of the project, if I go to the website and look at what it says our goals are, um, is basically we're interested in um, understanding the ancient Maya of uh, a specific part of Belize called East Central Belize, um, which is basically the district of Stan Creek today. Um, although we also uh, intend in the future to move on to more historic materials in that region as well. Um, this is this uh, research is, we hope, contributing toward what is considered urgently needed heritage investigations in the region because Stan Creek is a highly uh, developed in terms of industrial development uh, in, the, in the country. And this is related to uh, citrus, banana, shrimping, and probably with the most impact now, tourism development, um, which causes a lot of damage uh, to the archeological record. And in general, the Stan Creek District has been subject to very little archeological investigation, partially because it is considered sort of a frontier zone and is often being looked at as lesser than 
the more amazing uh, Maya archaeological uh, regions. Our work, just to give you an idea, is permitted through the government of Belize via the Institute of Archaeology of Belize, but we also are supported by the leadership um, in the community of Maya Mopan, which is the modern day community closest to the site we're currently working at, as well as the current landowner um, where the actual archaeological site or old town site is situated. And then we're funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. So just um, as I mentioned, the, the project, we are focusing primarily on understanding the ancient Maya, um, but we also research alongside modern Maya peoples who are, team, who are our team members. So today, in case you're not aware, um, there's about 6 million Maya people. Um, that's, you know, Alberta is only about 4.4 million. So there's a lot, it's a lot of Maya people <laughs> that still exist today that are important part of the world today. And they live in uh, parts of Mexico, Honduras and El Salvador, all of Guatemala and Belize. And there's about 28 or so different Mayan languages spoken and a huge number of different ethnicities within this grouping that we refer to as the Maya. And this would have been the same in the past as well. And so there's a considerable amount of cultural and historical um, variation and diversity as you go through different parts of the Maya world. And so this is important because when you listen to archaeologists talk, we often talk about the Maya. And that might be very similar to how we how people might talk about the indigenous peoples in Canada when they really are peoples. There are many different groups of indigenous peoples. They might have some common elements as all the different Maya groups have common elements, but so that there's not really any one group called the Maya. Um, we study primarily with Mopan Maya people, but also many Yucatec uh, Maya as well. Um, in terms of that, that, that identity that, that we refer to as the Maya, we can trace this back to about 3,800 years ago with the first um, agricultural villages in this part of the world. And then prior to that, indigenous peoples who were um, the ancestors of the Maya, um, you can trace back to about 14,000 years at least or from time immemorial. Um, so just to give you a sense uh, of geographic location, uh, uh, this map here is showing uh, the different cultural regions of Mesoamerica, so including parts of Mexico and Central America, and the orange section is the, the, Maya, the Maya world. And then uh, the other map here uh, shows a close-up, so how we divide up um, the Maya world, depending on uh, geography and climate and things like that. So our area of Belize um, is typically referred to as the Eastern Lowlands of the Maya world. So this is roughly the area of Belize. And this square here is the, uh, the, the smaller region of the Stan Creek District or East Central Belize. And that's where we'll be focusing on. Um, if you've ever been to places like Cancun, there it is at the very top. So to give you a sense in relation to where we are in the Maya world and the Maya world uh, up in these northern lowlands is, is often very, very different from what you're what we see down in this area. And one of the reasons for that is if you can tell from this image is this huge mountainous area here. And this is a, um, a metamorphic and igneous mountainous area. And and that's in opposition to most of this green area, which is um, limestone. So it's a karst shelf known as the Yucatan Peninsula. And so that difference, geological difference is hugely important to how people are living uh, in this part of the Maya world. And then the image on the bottom really gives you a sense of how uh, this is in the Stan Creek District or East Central Belize, um, just a bit further south from Alabama, um, which is the, the site I'm going to be talking about. And it gives you an idea that within one day, you could walk from the coasts and lagoon area uh, of the Caribbean through a pine savanna zone into alluvial uh, area, so with rivers and, and big forests and stuff like that, up into foothills, and then finally up into the main mountains of the Coxcomb Range of the Maya Mountains. So that's the big mountain uh, area near here. And if you see um, in the distance in the image, it looks like a, like a Coxcomb or a rooster's comb, right? And so that's why it's called the Coxcomb Range. And so we work at a site just within uh, just around the foothills area. So that's Alabama, which I'll talk about, but we're also starting some research up into the foothills area at a site called Pierce, which I unfortunately won't have time to talk about today. 
So, oh, just one other thing I'll mention too is an important part of where we are here is that there's major transportation corridors and communication corridors, particularly this coastal, all along the coast. Uh, the ancient Maya uh, and other groups of Mesoamerica were involved in sea trade all along the coast and then heading inland along rivers and also some uh, footpaths as well. And so Alabama is really at sort of a nexus of not only different environmental zones, but also different points of um, transportation, uh, communication, movement corridors as well, which is important to what we're talking about um, a bit later on. So Belize, uh, in terms of Belize in the Maya area, Belize is a, a very important uh, center for archeology span based tourism, uh, as well as archeological research in general. And despite its very small size and its small population, there's only about 300,000 people living in Belize, um, there's 17 archeological research programs happening, which is, is quite a bit. Um, research continues at a number of sites um, that tourists are able to visit, um, both local tourists and foreign. And here's some examples here. Uh, you have, uh, um, you have a little, uh, presentation here on. Uh, on uh, I think somebody needs to mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so here you have um, uh, a, the grandson of a friend of ours who are about who's about to climb up this this uh, temple here uh, at the site of Shunantunich. And Shunantunich has been subject to archaeological research for over a hundred years. So we know a lot about Shunantunich. Um, or over here is Caracol. You see someone climbing up. Um, it might be my mom, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> Caracol, uh, which is the largest ancient city uh, in Belize, um, likely had a larger population than any of the cities currently in Belize, and is still home to the tallest building in all of Belize. Uh, so an amazing site. Al Tun Ha down here, you can see my dad standing there, is probably best known because one of the main temple uh, platforms is found on the main beer in the uh, country of Belize. That's Belican beer there. Uh, and Lamanai up at the top um, has been was occupied continuously from the pre-classic, so like about a thousand BC, all the way through to the um, uh, arrival uh, of the Spanish and beyond. So a very continuous long occupation and research projects are still working at each of these places. These, these sites are more representative of sort of major central heartland cities, although they aren't all in the heartland, but they, they are very similar to what we see in the heartland areas uh, of the lowlands. Um, they're the ones that you see, tend to see in National Geographic and stuff like that. Um, small frontier communities like Alabama, where we're studying, tend to be less commonly studied, but they offer a chance to really explore the diversity of life ways represented by uh, the ancient Maya. And it's possible in our case also to start talking about the intersection of different Maya cultures or ethnicities, perhaps, uh, and even non-Maya groups and how that interaction occurs. So Alabama, um, the majority of research in general, so we talked, to, I mentioned sites that are well known to tourists, they've been studied for a long period of time. Um, most research in the country happens sort of behind the scenes at sites that are, are not open to the public. Um, and in general, few people tend to see them. A lot of them are on private property um, that you don't necessarily have full access to. And they remain protected by, um, bush, forest, that sort of thing, and soil that's covered them for over a thousand years. Or alternatively, they've been disturbed by modern agricultural activity. So just like here, people work their fields um, and they come across remains of the past. So that's very common in Belize. Uh, so the ancient town site of Alabama, which is what we're focusing on, is a bit of both. Um, so it's a strange name for a, Maya, for a Maya town because it's not actually its name. Uh, that was the name given to it uh, by archeologists in the 70s when it was first reported uh, to the government. And we don't actually know the ancient name. We don't have writing uh, at the site. So we don't know what it would have been called uh, by the people who were living there. Um, it's named after a banana plantation, the barracks and the associated village from the 1950s that was in that area and started sort of waning around the 1970s. 
Uh, in terms of the image here, so this is an aerial shot of the archaeological site and that big, the big cluster of trees in the middle, that's the monumental core of the site or maybe the downtown, you might think of it that way. If you go visit archaeological sites in the Maya area, that's mostly what you will see. You won't see the majority of any archaeological site because in this case, all around that forested area, you see modern orange orchard rows now, but that would have been, and it still is, there are uh, hundreds of mounds, uh, so little um, piles of dirt, mound, earthen mounds, uh, that are the remains of the houses of, of people that would have lived all around this area. So you have to remember that when you go see the Maya area, when you go see sites, you are only seeing monumental architecture. Some of it is domestic, but specifically for the elites and everyone else is out in the uh, sur surrounding settlement. Uh, so we have both this forested area and a modern agricultural area that we have to deal with with our research. Um, so uh, and then you've got the foothills here uh, uh, that sort of surround three parts of the site. And then if you went off in that direction, you'd end up into the mountains uh, of the of the Maya mountains. So we've been uh, in 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 the process of documenting the development of Alabama. Um, we we from our research so far, um, it appears that it booms around 650 or 700 AD. And at its height, it had probably around 1,000 people, maybe a little bit more. Um, and it lasted until about 900 AD. And so we've been very busy documenting that where and when of the boom development. Um, but now we're getting into questions about how and why that boom would have occurred. And 700 to 900 AD, that sounds like a long time from our perspective now, like, you know, Grand Prairie's not even, <laughs> hasn't even reached that. Um, but it's very short, short in terms of the ancient Maya, where most cities of the classic lowlands uh, were occupied for a thousand years or more. And uh, the, it's interesting too, that time frame, because that's when many cities of the heartlands were starting to decline. And if you read, um, uh, news articles about uh, the ancient Maya, you'll often hear that to people referring to it as the Maya collapse. Um, that's what they're really referring to is the decline of some of these cities as people pick up and move and form other cities and the decline of certain political uh, organizational types and they develop other um, forms of political organization uh, in the later part uh, of the Maya, uh, Maya history. Um, what's really great about Alabama in that short time frame is it really gives us a snapshot at the start of the development uh, of, a, of a community. Whereas in, in those cities that have a thousand years or more, they have multiple periods of boom, booms and busts, basically. Uh, and so we have this nice sort of little, relatively little um, thin sliver of time to actually talk about uh, without a thousand years more development over top. I talk about everything that's on here. Oh yeah, so. yeah. So sorry. On the side here too, there's um, there's the map at the bottom. That's just a the type of an archaeological map that we produce of what is under that forested area. Uh, so it's as if you're looking down. Uh, it's like a building plan, right? Like you're looking down on the floor plan of of the buildings that are there. Um, the one picture is what it looks like when we excavate in that forested area, uh, and then the other top. One is when we excavate in a site in that orange orchard area. So much more open. There's not all the big trees for us to, to have to deal with. Um, so as our name of our project suggests, we not only focus on a very particular um, town, but we also uh, focus on the district of Stan Creek or East Central Belize as a region. And um, this area is very popular to tourists. If you've ever been to Belize, you may have been to the beach towns of Placencia or Hopkins. Those are those are in the Stan Creek district. Um, we're concerned, uh, again, not only with looking at Alabama itself and the other site of Pierce, but also understanding broader processes from a regional perspective. And East Central Belize is a frontier re region, both physically, so it's where the mountains meet the sea, basically, and culturally. So historically, it's a region um, that is known to have been in between two uh, different Maya ethnic groups, um, plus other groups using coastal the coastal trade route as well. And so this, this pink out line on the map shows you sort of some of the sites we know about 
to date uh, archaeological sites uh, of the ancient Maya uh, in the Stan Creek district. And so we've been busy compiling as much of that information as we can to, 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 to situate Alabama in this broader um, regional pattern. Um, and just to, before I mention a little bit about uh, where we are in terms of our research now, just to give you an idea of our crew, this is our crew from 2019, which is our last field season prior to COVID hitting. Um, so of course, there's, there's me and Sean, who are co-directors of the project. Our community uh, liaison in the back here, standing next to Sean, is uh, Mr. Eugenio Chiak Sr., um, who's also um, our quote unquote foreman, although we don't really like using that word, but he loves it. Um, <laughs> up front here in the in the green, greenish or turquoise jacket is Dr. Jillian Jordan, who's another uh, co-director and is on the talk today or on the call today, um, who specializes in pottery analysis. And then of the others, I'm just going to point out a couple people who I think won't mind that I point them out. Um, so we have Virginia in the green shirt up here. This is Ms. Ms. Virginia Chiak, uh, who started out with us as a college student volunteer and has since um, come back as a formal field assistant and even an excavation supervisor as well. Um, and down below here is our youngest pro current project member in the red shirt. That's Mr. Diego Pacuil, uh, who is a student who was a student volunteer, and we're hoping he will now come back as a, a formal uh, field assistant now that he's been he, he's been trained. Um, in the archaeological techniques that we use. Um, the rest of, of the crew are, are either um, local individuals from Maya Mopan who uh, have been working with us all the way since 2014, or some of them are brand new, so it switches up each season. And then also in the picture are an MA student uh, from AU, uh, Dave Blaine, a UFC doctoral student um, from University of Calgary, Matt Longstaff, um, and a UFC uh, undergraduate student, uh, Nikki Phillips, who was with us last year and came with us in 2018 as a field school student. Um, regularly, we have volunteers that come um, from all over the world who are jo who join us. So if you are planning a vacation to Belize one year and you want to join us, just send me a line and we can talk about how that would be possible. And just to give you a sense how we've grown over the years too. So like our very first season in 2014, there was only seven of us for 15 days, all the way up to 2018, where we have, we ran a field school through the University of Calgary. Um, and that, that sort of shows our um, field school students, our research team, uh, as well as support crew, people who cook for us and stuff like that, geologists we work with, all different kinds of people in that team. So before I go any further, uh, I've talked about boomtowns and frontiers now, but I've not actually defined what we mean by boomtowns and frontiers. So I'm just going to take a minute because this also becomes important for our conversation about Byzantine. So when we're, when we're talking about boom towns, we're also talking about what has been termed rapid growth communities. And this is a common settlement type of uh, that occurs in frontier areas, um, but not, not necessarily only frontier zones. Um, and it can be traced back into antiquity all over the world. Um, the main characteristics tend to be rapid, so relatively rapid um, compared to the norm, rapid population growth, land conversion to accommodate uh, that population and their needs, uh, and the appearance of functional and placemaking needs. So things like infrastructure required for groups, groupings of people to live together. Um, you also have a unique and changing social fabric related to rapid incoming of diverse people and the interaction with existing peoples. Um, Political socio it tends to occur in areas of political, sociocultural, economic, or environmental frontiers or nexus zones and along key transportation and communication corridors. And then front, so frontiers, this element of frontiers is important because we typically are referring um, to the meeting point of multiple heartlands um, and they tend to be zones of mixture and interaction. Culturally, um, Frontiers are often portrayed as quote unquote lesser than versions of the heartlands. So for example, the Stan Creek district in terms of archeo their archeological remains has been known to be referred to as unnamed academics, a cultural backwater um, because it was being assessed from the heartland and from all the features in the heartland that are deemed to be important 
in that sense. Um, or they've been viewed as simply service or extraction points that are there to provide for the heartland. And when in actuality, these places, these are places of great innovation and uniqueness, and they really deserve to be studied uh, and recognized as such. So there are various reasons why boom towns might appear uh, in frontier zones. We tend to associate it with economic reasons related to modern capitalist society. But going back into antiquity, we can talk about boom towns related to trade and resource extraction, colonization, political vacuums, religious over or religious elements overpopulation issues etc and so for example something like religious elements we might turn to um, amarna in egypt where you have a mass a major shift in political and religious elements that cause them to build a brand new capital that sprung up very quickly so that would be an example of that um, we've published about our ideas about alabama as a boom town in the journal of field archaeology so you can again go to our website and access that as well so why are boom towns important? Basically, we're looking at a short time span, which is amazing for an archaeological record. It's not covered by later stuff. We can ask excellent questions about why places boom and how, but also how they bust. And if they're interrupted, where they we think they would have gone, what sort of trajectory were they on? Um, plus the different lifestyles, understanding different lifestyles from places um, that were uh, places that weren't around for a thousand years and were are of a completely different scale. So it's like saying we're only going to study London, England, and that will represent everything we know about our world versus what can Grand Prairie tell us about our world, right? So the, you, need to, you need to understand the different ends uh, of the continuum. So as I mentioned, our research now is focusing on the why of the Alabama boom. And we've been testing out a variety of hypotheses, including um, the first one is that we are dealing with a settlement that's related to local resource, resource exploitation for whatever reason, whether that's for trade or for just surviving in that area by locals or newcomers. Um, the way we've been looking at this primarily has been through um, the use of granite because that's a resource that's not found throughout most of the Maya world. Um, so we've been um, so we've been uh, we've previously hypothesized as have others that they're exploiting granite and they're fashioning things like grinding stones for grinding corn and other elements and trading that throughout uh, different parts of the Maya world because we find granite in other parts of the Maya world where they don't they didn't have access to that locally. Um, also, all of the architecture at the site is is earth core with granite on the outside. And that's really different for the Maya area. Again, most of the Maya architecture is out of limestone. Um, so we've been uh, doing a lot of studies focused on the use of granite, the, the extraction uh, and the shaping of granite, things like that, but also some uh, testing to figure out if granite in other parts of the Maya world actually come from the Alabama area. And we do have some instances where it is appearing, for example, on the other side of Belize in the Belize Valley, but not to any extent. Uh, we don't think that, you know, they're coming in to, to trade that far and wide. It's just been a few pieces here and there, but it's still an idea. We're also getting into studies about different resources um, that are, are quite, you not totally unique, but fairly unique uh, to this region. So chocolate, this was a big chocolate growing area as it is today. Um, salt along the coast. We often don't think about salt in our own societies, but salt, everyone needs salt. And so there was massive salt operations all along the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula um, and various montane products. So things coming out of the mountains, different woods and palms, uh, animals. So for example, jaguars uh, were hugely important in the Maya world, feathers and stuff like that. Um, so in our work, what we're trying to do is we're trying to characterize the resources of the region. Again, this is an understudied area compared to other parts of the Maya world. So we need to understand what is available to people both today and in the past, how they're using it, um, how they're manipulating those items, um, and as much as we can, how they would have understand, understood a lot of these resources, which is not easy to do for ancient, ancient times. 
Um, so this, the on the image here, it's just a little bit, we had to do another public talk about architecture and our understanding of how they were building stuff. And so we made this little IKEA inspired graphic to give you a sense of how they were building platforms at Alabama. Um, and then on the side here, a number of different, uh, we've been doing a, a number of different experimental studies um, in terms of shaping blocks, moving blocks, um, the sizes of blocks. Uh, the, the manufacture of different stone tools out of granite and how they can be used, things like that. Um, where am I? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so another hypothesis then uh, alongside this resource extraction is the idea that people may have moved to this area um, during this quote unquote collapse period because we know people were moving around. They were leaving cities and they had to go somewhere. Um, so our, our thought is perhaps that this boom is reflecting people that have moved from other parts of the Maya world, perhaps due to issues such as um, climate change. We know drought was a huge problem in lots of areas of the Maya world, but we also know warfare um, was unbelievably problematic, uh, as was um, shifting trade routes probably related to both those climate change and um, warfare elements. And so um, we're kind of wondering, okay, are these are these new people that have come in? And so if we combine these two hypotheses too, we could also talk about scenarios where you have political vacuums that happen because other cities are declining, people moving, um, and the shifting trade corridors, and that they're coming into new areas or meeting up with other people from those areas, or it's just people in those areas that are taking advantage of new trade routes, they're going to exploit exploit places uh, to allow them to succeed a bit uh, in different ways uh, than they had previously. Um, if this is the case, then it appears that the heyday of Alabama was pretty short lived um, as it eventually busts and people move away um, uh, after just a couple hundred years. Uh, but we still don't know who exactly is responsible for the rise of Alabama. Uh, so we're uh, our big question again right now is are these people from outside of this region or perhaps just further north in the region that are moving into another area setting up shop who are they meeting when they get there or is it completely empty and that's what some of our um new research is is it's demonstrating is that we actually now have evidence in four places uh, at the site where people were there in the early classic but then they left and there's an abandonment period about of about 100 to 200 years that we think might be related to a major hurricane or associated flooding events. And then the question then becomes, is it the descendants of those people that are coming back and reestablishing their community or is it brand new people or is it a combination of both? What are, what's going on? Is there displacement happening? And these questions are hugely difficult to get at archaeologically. And so this is this is where we are in, in, the, in our studies uh, about this. Um, so in terms of this figure here, this is just sort of to demonstrate uh, that how we have to deal with things like chronology. This is from an excavation uh, that Sean, uh, it, mostly Sean, has uh, directed, although uh, our MA student Dave Blaine uh, worked there, supervised the first first season of excavation there. Um, and on the side here, you've got a profile drawing. So I mentioned that sort of top down view, uh, is, which is a standard drawing we do in archeology. span Well, this side view uh, is another view. And so this is of what this building looks like cutting into it. But basically what we have here is in the red, that's that an early classic uh, building underneath a later building that is in a different orientation altogether, which is interesting. And then the stuff immediately above it, that's all part of later phases of construction. So this is how we have to try to tease things out in the end. Um, the last thing I'll just mention that we're taught, we deal with at Alabama a lot is the study of pottery. Um, and so this is uh, primarily the work of Dr. Jillian Jordan and her, um, her uh, assistance in terms of students, but also her co-collaborators uh, in terms of Yucatec and Maya uh, individuals who have been helping out, who I'll mention in a second. Um, and what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to understand what types of pottery are made at Alabama, 
what our trade wares that come into Alabama, because this is a potential to start teasing apart different people uh, at the site. So the way you make pottery is just like, you know, the way you might make bread is how your, your grandmother, your great grandmother has taught you. So there's different recipes, different ways you do it. Same, we can do the same thing with pottery. Um, and so we can start to understand uh, differences in, in populations through that way. And this is important because the number one question we say we get is, well, why don't you just look at human remains? And there's tests we can do uh, to understand where someone grew up and where they um, where they were for the last X number of years of their lives. So we can talk about movement that way. But the soils in Stan Creek are too um, acidic. So we can't do that. We have no human remains left. And frankly, I'm kind of glad because I don't like to deal with human remains. I don't like disturbing human remains whenever possible. So anyway, uh, we know for sure uh, at this point that we have at least four types of pottery that were being made at Alabama and a bunch of trade wares, a huge number of different types of pottery. Um, and uh, so that, that's been a, that, that's coming out um, as soon as I get our, as soon as I approve the edits from our revisions, that'll be out in the Journal of Archaeological Science Reports. And that's, that's a collaboration uh, between Jill, uh, between myself, um, Mr. Silvestro Chiak here holding the cacao pod, uh, who's a local Mopan Maya traditional ecological knowledge specialist and field assistant. Miss Aurora Saki, uh, who is a Yucatec Maya potter and healer who we live with uh, in Belize. And then Mr. Frank Zib, who is a Yucatec Maya tour guide and potter um, who started volunteering with us as a high school student. So there's tons more. I've way, gone way over my time. And now Sean is going to blow through the Belize or the Byzance and stuff. Not that we have a whole lot to talk about, frankly, but <laughs> he will get at it. Great. So thanks, Megan. Um, <laughs> Um, so for anybody who's, say, taken a class with me before, you know that I am not good at being short, so this will be a bit of a challenge. But, um, so since Megan and I moved to the Peace Region in, in 2019, we'd been chatting kind of on and off about the idea of starting a, a local project um, as a secondary project to kind of run parallel to our work in Belize. Um, Partially so because it would be easier to bring students to um, something in this region than, than Belize, but also because, uh, you know, it would represent an opportunity to engage the public here um, in the actual enterprise of, of archaeological fieldwork. Um, since we've moved here, we've developed kind of a, an interest in the, the history of the region. Um, and, you know, that, that's what led us to join the board of the, the archives. It's also what led us to just this last spring and summer during the you know, COVID lockdowns to get in our car and, and drive uh, you know, widely across the Peace Region, um, just exploring uh, various heritage sites, parks, things like this, which were all delightfully empty. Um, so it was, it was, it was quite, quite nice. Um, and what we noticed is that in general in the Peace Region, there's the opportunity to explore the same kinds of themes that we're exploring in our, in our Belizean research. So, for instance, from the perspective of settler populations, at least, right? This is a, a frontier zone, right? David Leonard has uh, described this as the last uh, frontier zone for settler expansion in, in Canada. Um, it's also a region that's characterized by a whole series of different uh, resources and the opportunities um, that go along those. So for everyday life, but also for economic exploitation, right? Um, and again, from the settler perspective, the main resource uh, was, was probably land. It's also a region that's characterized by, by transportation and connections, right? Um, if any of you uh, get the um, South Peace Regional Archive newsletter, the most recent issue is all about um, transportation, so um, rivers and, and trails and railroads and all of this kind of stuff. Um, some of the folks that are, are on the uh, presentation here today are, 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 are contributors to this. Um, so it's a great area for that. And because of all these things, it's also a big area for interaction, right? You get um, lots of people, not just settler populations in the last 100, 150 years, but also um, indigenous populations that have been living here again since time immemorial. Um, and so lots and lots of movement through the area. Um, it, it kind of ticks all those boxes for us. Um, the trick is actually 
finding an appropriate site to do uh, an archaeological project with because there are so many options available. And so we're looking for a place that has fairly strong research potential, but we're also looking for a site that is protected, right? And this is part of it. So um, things like illicit or illegal excavation, metal detectoring, um, things like this can have a, a fairly negative effect on, on the archeological record. So you, you need to find a place that's being sheltered from that to a certain degree, ideally. Yeah, fair enough. Um, we're also interested, just because of our interest in, in boom towns and so forth in Belize, we're also interested in material that's probably kind of in the, the post-colonial um, or post-contact colonial period. Um, it just seems to work for us. And so during our explorations last summer of all the places we went to, um, we went to, we ended up at Byzantium, the old Byzantium town site. And it ticks a lot of these boxes for us. This photo on the slide here, by the way, this is at the um, one of the public access areas or the day use areas um, with uh, maps and signs uh, produced by uh, Wanda Zenner, who I think we yeah we saw in the in the in the group here today. So thank you for that. This your your work is what's um, largely kind of pushing us Not to as yeah. Um, and so we were thinking that uh, Byzantium is a fairly ideal fit for this kind of project. In terms of where Byzantium is, the old Byzantium town site, um, I'm guessing most of you know already, but it's it's located just a few kilometers off of the present Highway 43 on kind of a secondary terrace above the Smoky River, not too far from the current Byzantium town site. Um, the Google Maps said that it was a 40 minute drive from uh, downtown Grand Prairie out to Byzantium, which is another one of the reasons that this site is actually of, of interest to us because it's it's accessible, right? Um, and there's it's it's immediately close to a, a population um, that could benefit from uh, work being done there. In terms of the site itself, um, it's a municipal park that was uh, developed by the uh, Byzantium Agricultural Society back in, in 1988 with a grant um, uh, from Alberta Heritage um, with the goal of preserving the history of our community and, and the Peace River country. And it is a beautiful park. Like it is well maintained. It's got fantastic day use areas. It's got um, excellent um, uh, camping uh, areas um, on the weekend. Um, and it's, it's in a, an assessment that was done as part of um, uh, essentially labeling it a historic site with, with Alberta heritage, Alberta culture these days. Um, a, an initial kind of archeological assessment, no, no actual survey or formal survey, but, but an assessment was done that suggested that this place had really, really strong archeological um, potential. Unlike the site that we focus on in Belize, Byzantium was never forgotten. It was never, you know, lost. It is a thoroughly historic site. And considering that it was only around for, well, a relatively short time, it actually has a significant um, historical record associated uh, with it. Um, and so given that, what does archaeology bring to the table? And archaeology plays quite well with history for a, a number of reasons. The first is that the historical record tends to be biased. All records are, right? Um, but one of the thing that, things that biases the historic record of this area about 100 years ago is that it was written by people that look, that look like this, right? That look like, look like me. In other words, um, it tends to be dominated by the voices of adult white males. Um, and in the case of Byzantium, um, one adult white male in, in particular, A.M. Byzantium. Um, and so he obviously wasn't the only person who was responsible for the founding of the, the historical site. And so um, there are all those other peoples, including, um, including other men, but also including women and, and children. And nor were settler populations the first in this area, nor the only ones that would have been engaging with the old Byzantium town site, right? And so indigenous populations are also largely silent from the specific historical record of, of Byzantium. And so archeology span gives us a way to look at these other populations that aren't represented in the historical record. Archaeology also gives us a way to check some of the things that we, some of the statements or some of our expectations or the stories, the narratives um, that are recorded in history. So um, A.M. Byzantium 
wrote a couple of pamphlets that were designed to try and attract people to the settlement and to the region, right? He also wrote um, a book here, Sod Busters Invade the Peace, an, an excellent read, um, and describes what it's like to live in this area and why everybody should come to Byzantium. And there's no doubt that he's describing, you know, real things, but at the same time, because it's an advertisement to try and encourage people to come, it's, it's also probably a little biased, right? Um, it's, it's looking at it through rose tinted glasses. And so archeology span gives you the ability to essentially test that, to, to, to look at what life was actually like. And then finally, archeology span is a really good way to interact with history and interact with the past because it is inherently hands-on. So um, if you can get people out and get their hands dirty and, and trying to understand what's going on, it's a great, great way of doing that. Um, were we to pursue an archeological project um, from the standpoint of kind of traditional archeological methods, a, a first step would be to conduct a, an actual archeological survey. This would be non-invasive, so instrument mapping, um, walking uh, across the area and trying to identify all potential signs of, of essentially human activity based on, on the surface. It would also probably involve some limited test pitting where you dig relatively small holes to uh, try and evaluate what the uh, archaeological material or the archaeological record below the ground is like. Um, there's every reason to think that it is, it is fantastic. So um, the initial documents that went in when the place was established as a park um, point out that there are things like, um, for instance, uh, well, gosh, uh, scattered cellar depressions, thanks. Um, there's refuse pits uh, or refuse um, mounds. There's pits of all different types, which could be things like, you know, root cellars and storage areas, but they could also be things like toilets, privies, the gold mine of archaeology, because um, toilets are fantastic. They are... Everything you don't want people to know about, you throw it down. Exactly, the <laughs> exactly. Um, and then there's also scattered artifacts and, and building outlines, right? And again, the, the folks who set up the park um, have signed a lot of it, right? So we know where the house, uh, Byzantine's house is. We know where Peterson's store is. Um, and yeah, and so, uh, and, and yeah, so it's great for that. Um, in terms of kind of how this would fit into our specific research, um, is this a frontier? Yes, without question, this is a frontier area from the settler perspective, right? Um, it's in the sense that it was, the old Byzantine town site was established kind of at the vanguard of uh, settler expansion into this area. Um, again, A.M. Byzantin first visited this area in 1906, um, wrote up a couple of pamphlets. You can see an example of the cover of one on the left to try and attract people to the area. And, and the settlement was established, the town site was established in 1910. Um, does it allow us to talk about population interaction? Yes, it does. Um, for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, the settler population, again, is not the first one in the region. There is a very, very long, you know, since time immemorial, Indigenous um, population that's living here. Um, there would have been interaction between settler and Indigenous populations at the old Byzantine town site, not least of which because one of the major crossing points or one of the major trails through the area at the time that the town is established was right down the hill from it. Um, so the, uh, at the time, there was a ferry that crossed uh, the Smoky at that location. And so um, lots of people of all different backgrounds and different types would have been funneled through and by the old Byzantine town site at the time. Is it a boom town? Well, yeah, um, definitely, right? Um, starting to be. Uh, so again, the, the ground was first broken in 1910. Um, the Grand Prairie Herald in 1914 um, says that there was a variety of businesses that had already been established by that point. So there's um, a sawmill, a restaurant and bakery, a livery and stable. Um, there's a blacksmith shop, a general store, um, all in all, including the residences, there were 14 buildings there. And this was just intended to be the start, right? Um, there were grand plans for Byzantium. This map that you see on the screen here, this was uh, kind of a I guess a plan for it. And if you'll notice, they have really wide streets because they were even putting planning on, on streetcars. This is going to be, you know, a big kind of cosmopolitan area. 
again, in terms of why it's established, um, a lot of the reasons why Byzance, the old Byzantine town site was established align with our research interests in Belize. So um, land, um, in, in this case, uh, the land for the old Byzantine town site was um, largely um, acquired through Métis script, which introduces a whole new kind of interesting angle to look at interaction. Um, there's a whole bunch of different resources here, right? So uh, it's it's located at an environmental nexus. You've got the high plains, which is great for agriculture. You've got lots of um, lumber and forest products. You've got um, low uh, river areas or lower areas near the river um, that tend to be milder. Um, so it's a great place for that. It's also a great place for, again, transportation. There's lots and lots of movement um, through this area. Um, including the, so there's the ferry, there's trail systems, but there's also um, a railway. Um, so Byzantine had spent a lot of time um, when he was scoping out the area originally, trying to find out where the railway was going to go and placing, planning his town with that in mind. We also know, um, can look at why it's abandoned. So um, in terms of the why, it's actually pretty straightforward. Like many uh, ghost towns here in Alberta, the railway did not come, um, which means that it didn't have that support. Um, also, the ferry that crossed just below Byzance and ended up washing down river to where the modern highway crosses the river. Um, and the government decided not to move it back. They just moved the crossing point and moved the trail. That's why the road is there these days. And then there was also um, World War I. Um, and so uh, the population of this region as a whole, but uh, the Byzantine town site in particular experienced a precipitous drop um, because of, of loss during World War I. And that should give you an idea, wow, of, of why we're here. Um, so what we wanna, what we are interested in, what we wanna do at this stage, but in terms, the other question is the, the how. Um, and so going back to Belize really, really quickly, our work in Belize could be described as a community engaged project in that over time since the project started, we have spent a lot of time trying to reach out to the community that we're working in. Um, we have a whole series of public talks each, each year. We have um, lots of social media engagement. We have uh, visitors who come to the site. We're um, partnering with the school system, right? We've got all of these kinds of things going on, but there are things that we've realized are important and, and have kind of added to the project. For Byzantine, um, we wanna take those lessons that we've learned from Belize and, and apply them right at the start. So something that would be considered a community-based approach, um, which again, thank you to uh, Taylor and Andrew um, at Research Innova and Innovation for setting this up because really this is the first stage. Um, this talk represents the first stage of this kind of community-based approach where we're trying to, um, you know, we conduct background research and identify topics and questions that are of interest to us, but also to the community at large, right? Um, we want to identify various stakeholders and rights holders and interest groups and, and disciplines. And, and we've started this process, right? Um, so we have partnerships with Athabasca University and GPRC and Taiga Consulting here in Grand Prairie. Um, Alberta Culture, the um, South Peace Regional Archives, you've contacted the, the Byzantine Historic Committee, but we still have a lot of work to do here too, right? Like there are populations such as various First Nations and Métis um, communities, so Horse Lake and Kelly Lake and Duncan, and Sturgeon Lake and Lesser Slave Lake and, and others that we need to kind of try and, and, and integrate with or, or get a hold of. Um, the Cluskin Hill Museum, um, the Grand Prairie Museum, and then various landowners, and then just individuals who, who might county. be interested, the, the county. Well, so then that's the another step. So um, then we also, so once we've kind of identified all of these potential partners, um, county included, yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> Part of this is also determining whether there's a need. We're interested in working at Byzantium, but if nobody else is, or if people have strong objections against us working at Byzantium, um, then that's obviously, you know, that's, that's a non-starter there. So starting with presentations like this, this is the chance for hopefully, except that we've talked too long, hopefully for people to tell us, um, you know, that they are into it or are not into it, right? Um, and so 
we can celebrate that. And then of course, once we've identified all those groups, then there's the official kind of um, permitting that we would need to engage in. So that's where we have to get permission from the county um, and yeah. permits from the government. And so that is that is that. <laughs> um, sorry, I know we went over time, a whole minute over time. Um, and More, we have- because we need to leave time for discussion. <laughs> yeah, I hope it's okay. It's very hard to talk about two research projects in a single presentation, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry, Taylor. <laughs> no, I think you guys did great. There was a lot to talk about. You covered a lot of ground in a very short amount of time. So that was that was really, that was fascinating. Um, so yeah, maybe we are a little short on time, but if, if our, if our uh, friends in the, in the discussion here want to stick around a little bit longer, um, well, we can answer a few questions. Um, so I suppose we'll invite anybody who's got a question if you want to um, drop it in the chat or if you just want to switch on your microphone and say hello. Um, we'll, we'll leave a, a bit of time for that now. We do have our emails there. So if you, you do have to leave, you can just um, uh, write to us and let us know your thoughts. Um, yeah, and just uh, if you wanna take anything away from the presentation, you can learn that the word boutique means thank you in Mopan Maya. <laughs> I mean, I hope you take away more, but at least one thing. So we see a couple people turn their mics off. Yeah, I have a simple question. Do you think there'll be a field season at the Byzantine Old Town site this summer? I mean, that's a that's no. a good question. It it depends, right? Um, so again, there's not excavation. Yeah, there won't be a there there wouldn't be a formal excavation in the sense of um, kind of opening up broader areas. If there's an interest, and if we get the permits, um, this first season would be essentially just that kind of evaluation period. So we would be um, mapping and doing some limited test pitting, um, which considering, again, that we're still in COVID times, I guess that's, that's not a horrible thing. <laughs> With ideally, like, and someone else asked in the chat uh, about time frames, time frames, so similar sort of things. You know, ideally, we would want to get to the point where we have this preliminary assessment so that it gives us an idea of, of what's there, what conditions there are, what's the community interest, all of that. We need all of that in order to then move forward. So the next stage then would be, you know, to apply for fund to develop a very concise research question alongside any collaborators we have. Um, so again, like Sean said, we've got research interests, but we also want to know what other people's interests would be um, in terms of, of doing this research uh, there. And we would have to formulate that and then apply for the funding and then move forward like that. And archaeology, especially community-based archaeology, is slow because you're taking time to build the relationships and the trust among collaborators. Uh, and this is, this is hugely important when we look at the history of archaeology, which archaeology itself was a discipline that was used essentially for the colonial machine in North America, right? Is that you are going to document people because they're going to be gone because we're making it a point of getting rid of people. And so they would send in archaeologists and ethnographers to do their thing and then they'd be gone and they'd take all the information and Never give anything back. Never give anything back. Um, and just the intent, the reason for it was quite unfortunate. And so now the building of proper uh, community based projects takes time. And so, although we have a goal of, say, getting to this stage by the end of the year, we understand that it's that's flexible. And then we would move on from that. But it's also something that we would hope, along with in particular, um, our, our colleagues with Taiga Consulting, so who are the heritage resource management archeologists that are established in this community, that it's something that it can start at Byzantine and over time it can hopefully spread to other stuff as well, that it's not just Byzantine, but this is a starting point sort of situation. And, and that relationship with Taiga is particularly important because Sean and I are very new to this region. And so, and then relationships with um, the archives um, through our board, but also through the Indigenous History Committee, um, creating those relationships and nurturing those relationships as we move forward. And with people with Byzantine Agricultural Society and the Historic Committee there, who we've really only met over email, trying to develop that. So it's a slow moving process. 
which is extremely frustrating for academics, um, particularly at the people on the administrative end of academia who want us to start going like this, right? So, um, so for now, our goal is to just get in and do um, some kind of a, an assessment maybe having people come along with us to uh, start talking about oral histories that exist uh, for the region. But that's sort of another whole realm of stuff that we actually specifically need collaborators for to help deal with that because we are not, that is not our specialization recording of oral histories and stuff like that. That's a whole other world of, of things. And so that's why we need strong collaborations with different academics, different local interest groups, different individuals uh, to be able to do that properly and ethically. Cool. Um, it looks like we have some other questions here. How can we keep informed of, of what future steps are happening? So um, we will try and reach out through through several means. So um, the uh, Facebook group for the uh, it, oh, the Byzantine Agricultural Society. Am I getting that right? There, there's one for the. There's a Facebook group for the old town site. There you go. So we'll um, we'll we'll try and we'll try and send stuff that way as as things are coming along. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try and figure out um, kind of some of those public Basically, venues. we'll end up, now that, that we've start identifying groups and people, our next plan probably is to have another Zoom meeting, not a talk, where we have people come and we actually just have a talk together, right? Yeah. That this is very much, except for this short part, it's us talking at you. Yeah. And now we want to have more time to just hear what people say and then try to figure out a structure to how this sort of thing would work. And again, we're very new to this type of work from a community-based project from bottom up. And so we also plan on bringing in people who specialize in that to help us and how to formulate this thing. Um, because that communication is hugely important for any collaboration. It, this was great, this presentation, because Taylor was able to send it to a whole bunch of people who then could spread it out to their their lists of so the archives, the Agricultural Society, various historic committees, things like that. And that's what we want to try to maintain and to solidify some of those networks so that anytime we move, we move forward with anything that comes out. Um, yeah, there's also a couple other questions here. So does this shut down the park aspect of the town site and for how long? So we, we don't have the direct ability to speak to that, but that certainly isn't our intention. Um, again, the idea behind it would be that uh, this is act would actually be something that would be attractive. So um, it would be something the that the public could come to um, when they're at the park. So uh, they could engage in an excavation with us, they could uh, observe. Um, and besides that, um, we would never have these, it's not like you excavate everything at once, right? Um, you would have relatively- And you never do excavate everything anyway. No, you'd have <laughs> relatively small excavations and relatively control areas. So it shouldn't affect the, it shouldn't affect the functioning of the park in any way, shape or form other than being another attraction. And other yeah. than perhaps getting a request that we would be able to be in there at times when not everyone, because I think the opening hours for it are May to September eight to eight or something like that for people to actually well. use on, on week, yeah, just on weekends. And so that would be, have to be a conversation to have with people who are, are responsible for the park is whether we can also be in there, say Monday to Friday or something like that. Because if we have to only do research on Saturday and Sunday, that doesn't leave a lot, like that that's, extends it even more. But that, those are conversations for down the line, but also really important that, yeah, we don't, as archeologists, we don't look to get in the way of how communities use places. Um, that same in Belize, right? Archaeologists work at sites that are open to tourists and they're working right alongside tourists coming to see them. It's not something that- um, It's not an either or situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, then Duff left a nice con. Thanks Duff. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hey. I'm, my name is Pat and I, uh, I work with the Peace Country Historical Society. I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but I had asked Taylor to, uh, if it might be possible to get some information that would allow us to uh, publish an article about this in our June newsletter. Uh, so I was just wanting to make you aware that 
the Peace Country Historical Society, of which there are several members on this on this presentation. Uh, definitely interested and would like to connect with you later. I think Taylor's going to facilitate that perhaps, at least for some information. But just, just to introduce us, um, perhaps I wasn't, I wasn't sure if you were aware that there is a group called that. Thank you, thank you. This is exactly the kind of connection that we were hoping to yeah. make through this. So thank you for that. And, and I guess in going back to Susan's question about keeping informed then, um, perhaps, perhaps we can use you as an outlet to try and keep people in the loop <laughs> with, with what's going on. Yes, that would be more than glad to do that because as you probably know, content is everything these days. <laughs> yeah. Now, for, normally, uh, normally we wouldn't be talking about a project this early. Um, this yeah. is, I, I'm sweating because I, <laughs> we, as, as archaeologists, we're, we're not used to talking about stuff we haven't done yet, except perhaps in an academic setting with other academics. And so to come forward, you're sort of making yourself quite vulnerable in this sense. Like, yeah, to expose your thinking process. Um, so, so, so yeah, uh, so in terms of, we can give you some stuff, but again, this is really early days. <laughs> Oh, no, no, I understand. I just think our membership, which is, uh, you know, it's just, it's about another 50, 50 to 60 people uh, would be super interested in this because Wanda, who's a member also has done a tremendous job of writing us articles about that end of the county of Grand Prairie. And I think all of our membership is aware and um, several people out there know things from just we're not professional historians by any means, but we've read enough local history and et cetera, et cetera, to know how Byzantium probably started and what finished it off. And, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff, why the railway didn't get there instead it came from the north. Right. So, yeah. Thank you. That's we've, we've both been very overwhelmed since we came here to see how many different historical societies and interest groups and things like that there are in this region it's really amazing and it's so encouraging too right that to come to a place where people are so interested in their not only the recent history but the deep history as well um, and as archaeologists we don't always find that where we go so it's lovely to to meet so many people yeah. with no, there really is. Uh, the peace country is a little bit unique. And one of the uniquenesses is you, you can almost hold it in your hands and understand at least the settlement period. It's not like you have to memorize the name of a castle from 1395 or something. <laughs> Sorry, I, I need to quit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pat, and for sure we'll we'll get in touch later so that we can we can facilitate that conversation further offline. Um, we've got we maybe can take one more question from the chat, and then we might have to wrap it up just so we can uh, we'll be respectful of everyone's time. We can move on with our day here. Um, uh, Tony says theoretically, if all the permissions are obtained and you're able to create an archaeology site in Byzantine, what will the environment of the town site look like, and how will it be changed? Um. I mean, I, I, that's a good question, Tony. Um, so right now, uh, the, for the most part, the cleared areas of the park um, are in areas that were uh, things like the main street and so forth. Um, the locations where the buildings had been. And so the buildings, again, for all of you who, who haven't been out to the old Byzantine town site, there are no standing buildings there. Um, they either fell down um, and others were removed, right? So um, all you have are the locations where the buildings had been. For the most part, um, those locations, which are things like depressions and stuff like this, uh, are covered in, in bush now. Um, so, you know, some older trees um, and, and scrub brush. In order to do our work specifically on those structures, um, and any kind of associated refuse pits and stuff like this, it would require some clearing. Um, but typically we try and avoid any kind of major clearing. You, uh, you strategically place your, your, any of your excavation units to avoid any major cutting. So it would be 
cleaning brush but not cutting trees typically? Just as an example, we both worked at the archaeological site of um, Yashnoka in Campeche, Mexico, and that's part of a, a biosphere, a protected biosphere, and we were never allowed to cut anything larger than a Coke can. Uh, so thicker than a Coke can in terms of, of trees. And so we have a number of methods um, that we can adopt depending on what, what types of protection um, uh, organizers and uh, want maintained. So that's never been a problem for archaeology. We just tinker with our methods and, and adjust. Um, like, for example, if we were to excavate at a building, rarely do we ever excavate an entire building we take a representative sample. And so in my case, I study houses. Most often what we tend to do is dig to the side and back of houses where, where I work because that's where most garbage ends up uh, in, in the Maya area. And so we would try to, with understanding sort of refuse patterns in um, uh, settler communities and, and non-settler communities or indigenous communities that we can try to target areas, smaller areas to get representative samples that allow us to understand what was happening in the building. There are some situations where we do sort of extensive excavations to say understand the floor plan of a building, but in this case we don't need to because we've got sort of the cellars, uh, pits that were underneath buildings and some sort of outlines, but the actual floor plan would have been the buildings that have been removed uh, and brought elsewhere, um, which we didn't really talk about the fact that there are no standing buildings at the town site anymore. It's all just sort of the footprints of what's happening, which is great because that's what we deal with in the Maya area, it's sort of just the footprints, although a bit more substantial, but uh, it's the same, it's the same techniques that we apply to do that. So we don't need to cut large areas. So it wouldn't change the atmosphere in that sense of. Although it also could, um, in the sense that whatever methods that we employ and whatever would be directed or dictated in part by consultation, yeah, right? Exactly. So, so for instance, say the, the county and park managers wanted um, a larger area cleared, right? They, they wanted, um, for instance, a building excavated in its entirety. And because, the province allowed it. And us. the province allowed it. <laughs> um, because they would, you know, there would be the desire to say, turn that into a, again, a, a park feature or something like this. That's also something that's on the table. So all of that kind of stuff in terms of the way it would actually look, that is something that happens in consultation with the community and with the province and with the municipality and, 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 and county. Count, county, yeah. Um, so, thanks. Yeah. Awesome. A county is a municipality. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I think we should probably wrap up here. We're a little bit past time, but I really, I just wanna say thank you so much to everyone, especially everybody who's, who's hung on to the bitter end here. I'll let you know that um, a, a version of this recording will be made available for a little while afterwards, after the presentation on GPRC's YouTube page. So you can access it there. Um, and of course you can always reach out to Sean and Megan uh, through the contact information on the screen if you have more questions or just wanna chat. Um, yeah, and anything else uh, before we wrap up, Sean and Megan? I guess that if you, yeah, if you are interested, if you, if you're interested in taking part in some way, definitely make yourself known to us. If you have maybe feedback that, you know, isn't necessarily encouraging to us to do the research, still let us know. We want to hear that, and you might not be comfortable with vocalizing that in a public space, but let us know, and let we have a conversation about that. And again. Um, this is the same deal we have with the community we work with in Belize. If it's if it gets to a point where you're like, no, 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 you just tell us and then we step back and it's done sort of deal, right? Um, but also as soon as we're able to identify people, then we plan on hosting an actual Zoom conversation. Like an um, open house. Like an open house to just talk with people and, and get a sense of how, how we can specifically move forward um, and who wants to be part of that actual moving forward versus someone who just wants to be communicated with what's happening sort of deal. Which means if you know anybody else that might be interested, please, please, yeah. please pass on um, kind of the word to them. That'd be very much appreciated. Right on. Well, thank you so much, Sean and Megan, for a really fascinating, wonderful presentation. Um, and thank you again, everybody who's joined us. We'll let you get on with your day and um, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, Andrew. Bye, guys. <laughs>